the right choice. We've looked throughout this Advent season at the right time and the right place and the right gift and now the, the right choice. There are so many choices in our lives. As we were talking to the kids this morning, just, you know, the simple basic things that we, you know, decide on each day. But, you know, even like going to the grocery store and, well, I need a bottle of shampoo. How many different types and varieties of, of shampoo and, and you know, other types of hair treatment? And, you know, it's just like mind-boggling how many different choices you have there. You go over to the cereal aisle and the same thing, all kinds of cereal there. We have choices for this and that and the other thing. It's, it's one of the blessings that we have. We have such an abundance. But sometimes choices can be paralyzing uh, as well. We just kind of get in this... What do I choose? What do I choose? What do I do now? Today we're going to be looking at choices. How we make thousands of choices each day. Some pretty small and insignificant, but others more life-shaping. Deciding as you are in school, am I going to continue on and head toward college and, and a career in, in that field or in that direction? Or maybe I'm looking at a job or a trade school or maybe I'm taking some time off and traveling. These are choices that we make that shape our lives. For many people, it's also choosing a spouse. Is this person the right person? Will we get along together? Will we be happily ever after? Are we compatible? Do we love each other? And it's just like sometimes those things are difficult to come to grips with, especially if you felt a lot of brokenness in relationships in your life. And then, you know, deciding where to live and, and what kind of house to live in, an apartment. Do we rent now for a while and build up money? Do we start in a small house? What can we afford? How much money do we put into a house? All of these choices shape our lives. The choices that we make, the things that we decide to do or not do, are based on our values and our priorities. What we think is the most important, what was going to have the best outcome, that's what shapes our choices and what or whom we put first in our life is that highest priority is that greatest thing that, that kind of directs whether we go this way or that way, whether we choose this or that, whether we hold off on a choice and wait until later. What's at the center of our choices? You can tell a lot about someone by the choices that they make, how they spend their time, how they spend their money, on what do they invest their talent and resources the most important choice that we will ever make is the choice on whom we will serve. In the book of Joshua, that transition has taken place now. It was Moses who led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt with that mighty hand and outstretched arm, the ten plagues and the Passover, going through the Red Sea, going through the desert, the giving of the Ten Commandments, now to the Promised Land, and Joshua has taken over. At the end of the book of Joshua, they have conquered the promised land. They have driven out the, the uh, immoral Canaanites, and God has given them this land. But Joshua assembles the people one more time before they settle in their homelands. And he says to them, listen, folks, God has brought us all of this way. God has done all of these things for us, but you've got to make a choice a very conscious choice in your life. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors whom they serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites or those in whose land you are now living. But he says, but for me and for my household 
as your leader and to show you the direction that is best for your life. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Israel had a lot of choices. There were options in their life as well. They could look back to their ancestors going way back to Abraham and before God called him. They were the gods uh, that were in that land there by the Euphrates River. They were the gods of Egypt, the, the gods that uh, they became acquainted with when they spent the 400 years in Egypt. And now they were living in the promised land. And though they had driven out those nations around them, yet the gods of that land were still around, were still present. And if you know the biblical story, you know how often that god Baal comes up. Baal is a god of fertility. He's often depicted with a, a, a lightning bolt in his hand. A god of the thunderstorm, the god of rain, but then with that, the productivity that would come from the rains and the thunderstorms, the, the wheat and the barley that would grow, they felt was a gift from God. And so they would pray to Baal, God, send the rains, send those fall rains, those spring rains, so that we can have a harvest, so that we can have bountiful food. Baal, hear us. Baal, be merciful to us. And they would offer up sacrifices to Baal so that those rains would come and the land would produce. You can see how important this was in their minds to serve the local gods because agriculture is local. If you don't get the rain, nothing grows for you. And starvation happens quickly. And that fertility also then extends to family. Having children, living a long life, being able to see your grandchildren and watch them grow. And so Baal, the God of fertility, give us good health. Give us many children. Bless our family. And you know, is it really that much different for us? No, maybe we don't have some picture of a guy, you know, sitting on our living room mantle with a lightning bolt in his hand. But don't we often pray for prosperity, for good things to happen to our, in our lives, for there to be resources, to have good health, the health of children and, and grandchildren being born? I mean, we can understand what is behind that. Though their focus was on a foreign God, we all understand those needs and concerns. Joshua said to them, don't be looking to Baal. Baal is not the true God. Though Baal is the local deity here, God, the God of heaven and earth, the God who created all, he is the one who holds these things in his hand. He is the one who came to your father, your forefather Abraham, called him out of that land of Ur and the Chaldeans and brought him to this land who spoke to him and said, Abraham, I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will have many descendants. You will settle in this land. Through you, Abraham, all peoples will be blessed. And then through Abraham, and then Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 ch children of Jacob, becoming the 12 tribes of Israel, each step along the way, through the rough patches and through the smooth patches, God has been with you. He has cared for you. He has watched over you. He even led you through that dreadful desert. He's even brought you now into this land and, and conquering nations and, and cities and kingdoms who are much powerful than you. And so Joshua says, yeah, you can choose for yourselves whom you will serve. If you want to go back, if you, want, you think these are the legit gods, that's up to you. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I am convinced to the core of my being that God is the one to whom I owe all of my life. Israel, whom will you serve? For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And so our choices, our choices come. And it begins right there in saying, how will I structure my life? What will be the focal point for me? What are my priorities and my values? And, and we live in a very blessed country. We thank God for that. That's wonderful. But sometimes the values and priorities of our country, of our nation, of the culture that we live in, don't always measure up to biblical priorities and standards. And we need to be aware of that. This American dream, this, this blessing of, of prosperity, if you work hard enough, if you apply yourself, you know, you can get ahead, you can buy the nice house, you can have the family, you can have the car and the dog and the cat, you can go on vacations, you can relax and take it easy, live in peace and security. All those are wonderful things. But if they, if we worship the thing rather than the giver of the gift we've gone astray who will we serve will we keep our focus on the Lord and serving him that's the big decision that we've got to make the primary life shaping decision is who stands at the center of our lives? And quite frankly, folks, the American dream says, me. Me. I am the center of my life. Everything revolves around me. What I want, what I desire, what I will work for, my comfort, my security, my pleasure, my desires, that's what I will choose. We're serving the Lord we have to sacrifice the me and say, no, you don't have first place in your life. Jesus Christ has first place in his life. And sometimes he calls us, say, don't choose for you. Choose for others. Choose to stand up for them. Choose to reach out to them. Choose to contribute to them. Will you serve the Lord? Oh, th these decisions have always been there. In the time of Elijah, many, many years after Joshua had, had made that stand, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now Elijah is there, and sure enough, the people still worship God. The temple service was still going on. Everything on the surface looked like it was all just fine. But in their hearts, the people were playing a double game. We would worship God at the temple, but on a day-to-day -day level, we would make sure that Baal has his due as well. It's kind of like covering your bases, you know? Make sure that you love and serve God, yes. But, you know, Baal may have a little influence too, and so we want to give him some due as well and trust in him. And Elijah says, how long will you waver between two opinions. And the word there's like like dancing on, on, on two feet. Did you ever try to like country dance on one leg and, and, and break dance on the other leg? It just doesn't work, does it? You look pretty awkward. You look pretty stupid. I mean, I look pretty stupid when I dance anyway, but you know. But, it, but if one leg is keeping one beat and the other leg is on a whole different beat, your body is just not working right. And he's saying, how long will you waver between these two opinions? If God is God, serve him. Give him your whole heart. Don't hold back. But if you think Baal is God, then go for that. Don't keep pretending that you're serving the Lord in your outward appearances, but your heart is really on, this is what I want for me. It's not going to work that way. God sees through phoniness. He knows where our hearts are at. God wants to bless us, and God has blessed us with many things. That's good. 
But to me, this is where I find the danger for myself. I tend to put God's blessings before him. In other words, I want the things. I want the health. I want the security. I I want the resources. I want the comfort more than I want my relationship to God. In other words, I'll have a relationship with God, but it's in order to get the good that he can give me. And when those things start to get taken away or looking a little shaky or, or a little threatened, then I want, well, God, where are you? Where are you? What are you? You know, you're supposed to be blessing me. And that's a huge, huge danger for all of us who live in a blessed community. What do we really want? More about me? And God is the means to get more for me? Then we're not putting God first in our lives. We're putting his blessings first. There's a danger of turning God's good gifts into our own gods. And you'll hear our politicians play on that. They will try to uh, arouse in you either fears or desires which appeal to you. And they'll say, if you elect me, that's what we'll work on. That's what we'll do. And try to draw us, you know, a strong economy or secure borders or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, You know, uh, prosperity for all. They're appealing to the me. And it's so hard in our system to sort through all of that and to cut away the clutter and all the animosity and saying, God, what do you desire? And how do I make a decision as I cast my ballot and and the priorities that I live by and the resources and how I use them? How do I put you first and foremost? The daily choices that we make Show, reveal what's really in our heart. How we use our money. How we use our time. How we use the things that God has given to us. Does God stand first? The little decisions add up to a lifetime commitment. And so you may be sitting here this morning saying, you know, Pastor Dave, I'm good, really. You know, I I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart when I was a teenager, and, um, you know, I'm good. I'm going to heaven. All set. Awesome. I'm so glad that you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. But now the challenge for today is on a day-to-day level, what does that look like? On a day-to-day level, in the choices that you make and how you spend your money, how you spend your time, how you treat other people, does it reveal in your life that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? In other words, does he call the shots? Does he direct your path? Does he shape and influence the decisions that you make on a day-to-day level? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That about covers everything, doesn't it? And so keeping that at, at the center of our lives... How do I love God in this situation? And you may choose one political party or you may choose another with with reservations on either one. But how then will you demonstrate in that choice? This is how I love God. This is what I'm going to work for. How you use those resources. Is, Is God at the center of that? Or is it more about me? 
Little decisions add up to a lifetime commitment. And Jesus challenged his disciples back when he was here on earth and in tw- at the dawn of 2019 as well. He says to each one of us, he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. That's saying no to the big me in, in my life. Deny themselves, take up the cross, That is, be willing to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. Be willing to deny ourselves the things that that we want for the benefit of others, for for the good of God's kingdom, and then follow Him. Follow Him that our choices are aligned with His Word, with His decisions, how He has revealed Himself to us. Because you may think by choosing for me, You're saving your life. You're getting a better life. But friends, in the big picture, you're losing it. But whoever loses their life, that is, lays down their life, sacrifices their life for the good of Jesus Christ and for others, those are the people who truly find it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Over Christmas time, I had to chance to connect with a friend, friend from high school, someone who always had a drive to succeed, never always did that great academically, but had the strong drive to succeed, started a business after high school in the auto parts uh, supplier and and was able to acquire more businesses and, and work things out in such a way that business grew. He was successful. He knew what he was doing. He he could manage things in such a way that that business was growing and growing. Always busy, constantly busy, because his head was always in that business and saying, what can I do next? Thinking ahead, thinking about the changes in the market and and being prepared for that. Just a a, a brilliant mind for business. And And it came out. He gained and he gained and he gained. The business grew and grew and grew. But it was a 24-7 kind of lifestyle for him. Yes, he was married, he had kids, but daddy was always working. Daddy was always gone. Or even if he was home, daddy's mind was always on business. He was always somewhere else, mentally or physically. And, you know, church was nice. He would show up occasionally. He was a professing member. But it didn't have a priority in his life. He had always so much other stuff going on. Don't ask him to volunteer at church. Well, recently this friend found out he had cancer. They had done surgery. It looked like things were on the men, but then the cancer returned again. And as he is struggling with this right now, he said, you know, in my life, any time a problem came up, if I could just throw money at it, I could solve it. I could make things happen. Money has that kind of power. It it, it can buy you good things. But I'm beginning to realize now that there's a limit to what my money and my energy can do. This cancer thing, doctors are saying, we're we're sorry. We've kind of run the end of the options for you. He's scared. He's scared. He's used to being in control, used to calling the shots used to having things go his way, and now it's not. Just tried to acknowledge that with him. We talked together, said I'd pray for him. Encouraged him to be thinking about Jesus. And who is Jesus in his life? Didn't try to shove it down his throat, but 
He's the one who's helped me through. He's the one who's given me so much, yes, but also even in those difficult places in my life. He was the solid rock to which I could turn back, turn back to when everything else was falling apart around me. I'm praying for my friend. I don't know what his time left will be. And it's so hard for him because on the one hand, he's made a profession as a Christian, but yet never really surrendered his life to Jesus. Have you? Have you? In the bottom of your outline, there's just a question. Whom will you serve? says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Come what may, up or down, thriving economy or stocks tanking, good health or bad health, prosperity or scarcity. We will serve the Lord. And if that is your desire, to surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, then I encourage you to put your name there on that line. Just stick that in your Bible. With today's date, December 30, 2018. And then every day, as you pull out that Bible, as I want to encourage you to do, there's that commitment. For all the day-to-day -day little decisions and the big picture decisions, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we've gone through this time of Christmas. We've seen how you have worked out so many things just in the right time, in the right place, that you are the right gift. You are the Savior of the world, but today it really boils down. Have we made that choice, that fundamental decision that we will serve you on a day-by-day, -day, decision by decision basis that you occupy center place in our lives? Thank you for being our Savior. We're so grateful for that. But now today, we also want to say you also are our Lord and King. Help us to follow this commitment each day. We can't do it on our own, but in your power and your strength, we can. In your name we pray. Amen.